Hi everyone, Terrible Dactyl here, and welcome to another episode of Jurassic Plastic. I'm here today with the 2001 Carnegie Collection Dimetrodon. Uh, this review was actually a request, so uh, shout out to Andrew Sarkis. So this was the second version of Dimetrodon produced by the Carnegie Collection. Uh, this came out in 2001, and the original uh, was one of the first Carnegie models that came out in 1989, although its date stamps 1988. You can see the original one was much smaller being in 1 40th scale. Um, however, uh, interestingly, they really did a good job of almost exactly replicating the pose of the original, even down to the spacing and angle of all of the little uh, neural spines that make up the sail here. They're almost the same, except uh, actually mirrored a little bit. You can see the foot position uh, and the way that the head is turned are the same on this side of the original and the update, and if we flip them, very similar pose when we look at that side. Now obviously the larger scale uh, that Carnegie was using for smaller animals uh, in the uh, late 90s and 2000s was uh, allowing them to get a lot more detail in there. I have the original version of the first Carnegie Dimetrodon, which I think has uh, better detailing in that it's a little bit smoother, the bumpy little scales are a little bit more clearly defined, um, but a lot of the ones that you'll see on the market have uh, much cruder detail. It's been a little bit remolded. And, you know, even for the original, there's only so much detail you can get on such a small little replica like this at 1 40th scale. Um, for example, you can't even really see the teeth in here. They are just barely sculpted. They're not even painted. So obviously it was probably a smart choice to introduce the larger scale. Uh, now this was advertised at 1 10th scale. However... Uh, Dimetrodon in real life, uh, assuming that this is based on Dimetrodon grandis, which it probably is based on the shape of the skull, uh, would have been about three meters long. This model is just about 20 centimeters long, and that puts it closer to 1 15th scale. Now you can imagine that maybe this is not based on a full-sized individual, which is fine, you know. Not every animal that you're going to encounter is maximum possible size. Thanks to its larger size, you could get much better detailing, and uh, the you can see the detail on the scales here is very nicely done. The scales are very small, probably appropriately so for an animal this size, although we don't really have a very solid handle on what stem mammal skin would have been like. There are minor reports here and there of skin impressions. Nothing that I know of for Dimetrodon in particular. These scales are nicely brought out by the dark wash. So it looks like this model was given a base coat of paint of some kind of like maybe light brown. The base color plastic seems to be really dark brown. And then it got some washes and a little bit of airbrushing on these yellow um, spots and highlights here. But overall, uh, I really like the paint application on this. It's got that very painterly feeling to it, where you can really see areas where the paint has clumped up, like in between the wrinkles, areas where the paint has kind of run off, leaving some of the detail visible. And that's one of the things I really like about the old original Carnegie models, uh, is that glossiness to the paint, the really hand-painted look and feel. I don't really like the airbrushing so much, and I feel that it does not, at least on my sample, I'm sure there are probably earlier samples of this closer to the year of production that had a really sharp, um, nicely blended, at least paint application on these yellow spots. This one's just a little hazy, a little muddy, uh, looks a little bit rushed. And kind of the same thing for the white, uh, off-white highlights here on the sail. I think if those were a little bit more sharply applied, uh, it would be a nicer effect as of right now. I'm not really quite sure what effect they're going for. It almost looks like they wanted it to have a, a shiny appearance, almost like the sun is glinting off of the sail. Um, or maybe they're supposed to be markings. I'm not really sure. Like I said, I'm pretty sure this is not a year of issue um, model, which tend to be of a higher paint quality. Although the paint quality on this is pretty good. Especially if we get in here on the face, you can see that the detailing is pretty good. There's a little bit of sloppiness around here. For example, some of the yellow on mine moves uh, onto the teeth a little bit. Um, but the teeth are nicely sculpted. They're sharply defined. And the uh, detailing, the wrinkles, and everything around the face are really cool. 
The detailing on the feet, at least on my model, is a little bit more crude. You can see, especially on the back feet here, um, it's a little, little muddy on that sculpt, a little soft, some chunkiness of the plastic getting stuck in between. That, once again, could be due a little bit to mold fatigue um, by virtue of the fact that this sample was produced probably a couple years after its original issue. Just flipping it around to the other side, you can see it's got a nice dynamic pose like it's striding forward. It's a little hard to see from this angle, but the belly is held off the ground at least a little bit. Um, there is some recent research into Dimetrodon, uh, particularly if you look up a um, blog post about a skeletal diagram that was produced by Scott Hartman. He goes into detail about some recently discovered trackways that show uh, Dimetrodon may have had a high walk the way that uh, crocodilians do, where if they're moving quickly, they would have really brought their uh, limbs under their body a little bit more than usual and walked with the belly well off the ground. Now, obviously, that wouldn't be necessarily a typical way for them to walk, and they certainly would sprawl on occasion. Sometimes they would need to. Sometimes they want to get close to the ground. So I don't think the posture in this model is inaccurate, uh, even though we do know that Dimetrodon was capable of high walking it wouldn't be locked into that position by any means. The one thing that Scott Hartman brings up in his blog post that could render this model and really most Dimetrodon replicas inaccurate is the shape of the vertebrae. So the vertebrae in front of the hip, about this section right here, would have uh, had a bevel to it, which caused them to kind of sit together on an angle, giving it almost a little bit of a humpback in that area. Uh, a little bit of a dip here going down into the hips, a little bit of an arched back, not arched all the way, but just in this back half of the back. It would have had a little bit of an arch to it. Um, Scott Hartman was a little bit uh, baffled by that when he discovered it in the production of his model. I'm not sure if there have any, been any peer-reviewed studies confirming this or not, but he did mention that he reached out to some synapsid specialists and they were like, yeah, it looks like it's pretty much on the money. Uh, that reconstruction. So we might have to revise our thinking about the posture of the back, at least, of Dimetrodon a little bit. Another thing that is pretty much ubiquitous in Dimetrodon replicas uh, that may be inaccurate is the extent of the actual soft tissue sail. So Dimetrodon's most famous feature by far is this sail, which is composed of these long spine-like neural spines coming off the vertebrae, and then a web of skin and other soft tissue in between. Uh, a 2012 study showed by close examination of these neural spines in a bunch of different Dimetrodon specimens that first of all, the texture of the spine itself changes from the bottom as you get up to the top. The bottom of each spine had a very rough bone texture, suggesting that it was probably embedded not only in skin, but in reasonably tough um, muscles, tendons, and really just the flesh of the back. So we could probably extend this brown and yellow section of the back up a little higher where this light brownish section is really painted here, almost giving it um, a, a hump appearance on the back beyond where the centra or the main bodies of the vertebrae would be. Above that, they had uh, some fibrous or striation uh, type markings on the neural spines, confirming pretty much that they were embedded in the skin. I don't think anybody really thought that they weren't, um, but you know, there's always the remote possibility that there was no sail, that just had a bunch of these long spines sticking up off of it, like some reconstructions of Amargosaurus. Interestingly, above that, the top, you know, maybe one quarter or so, or maybe even a little bit less than that, of each neural spine had a really smooth bone texture. That could imply that they were individually covered with uh, some kind of sheath, like a keratin sheath, or or something that, that would imply that they are free of the web of the actual sail. And also confirming this is the fact that in many specimens, the top section of each neural spine is not this straight. A lot of specimens that have these really straight neural spines have been at least partially reconstructed. And in specimens with complete neural spines, these things are going all over the place. They're twisting, they're turning, they're bending in various different directions, 
which would be really weird if you had a sail that was just completely warped and twisted all along the top. What is more likely going on here is that at least the tops of these neural spines were free of the sail and were bent. Some of them almost look like deer antlers going in crazy different directions. So this really simple, elegant view of, of Dimetrodon, unfortunately, uh, looks like it is probably inaccurate. But for the time that this was produced in 2001, this model was completely reasonable. They even went to the effort of making its tail held off the ground as if maybe it's about to start into a high walk. Um, I don't think there's any reason to think that it necessarily would have held its tail off the ground all the time as, as a dinosaur would. Um, but it's nice that they uh, gave a nod to that kind of dynamism uh, in, when they took into account the pose. I'll just give you a quick walk around so you can see this Dimetrodon from a few different angles. It does have a really nice paint job with that yellow and brown, especially when you view it from the top and you can see how the stripes on the back sort of go all the way across the back, uh, regardless of the presence of the sail. It almost has a uh, Gila Monster type uh, vibe to it, which I think is really cool. And let's do one more shot of that gorgeous head sculpt there. In my opinion, this is uh, one of the best Dimetrodons, probably that is still uh, available. Well, not that it's in production, but it's relatively easy to get uh, on the secondary market, on eBay and things like that. The new Safari Dimetrodon is really nice, but I actually have to say that I think I prefer this one compared to the newer Safari one. Um, the Collect Day one is probably a little bit more accurate. I think it does have those uh, top of the neural spines that poke out a little bit. It's a little bit more scientifically up to date, but the problems with this one are not that extreme. And I think for my money, this is probably still the best uh, Dimetrodon model or replica that it probably has been made in, in this category at this price point. I usually do a little size comparison with my Mark's uh, Neanderthal caveman, but since this is not a 140 scale model, I'm going to put my Carnegie Australopithecus in here, which is a 115th scale model. So it is right in scale with the actual measurements of the Dimetrodon. Well, that does it for my look at the 2001 Carnegie Collection Dimetrodon. I hope you enjoyed this review of another great Carnegie replica. And if you did, please like this video, leave a comment, subscribe to get more from Jurassic Plastic, and I'll see you next time.